everybody. Welcome back to this. I'm your host, Shauna Griffiths. And today's real talk is with a real leader who's a warrior. She is a friend of mine, an advocate, a marketing genius, I will say. Um, and she's been on a path of purpose in her life and in her career. So I'm super happy to introduce you all to Shannon Hughes. Shannon, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, Shauna. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad we were able to reconnect. So folks, I'll give you some context. So Shannon and I met at a conference called, I'll call it a conference experience called Hatch. Yeah, and if you could Hatch, summarize it in one word, we would give you a gold medal. So yeah. <laughs> so Hatch is a network um, that really uses creativity to just as it sounds, hatch a better world. Um, and so I was at, I was lucky to be, um, recommended and I attended and there was this woman there the whole time. And I was like, wow, she looks so cool. She, was, she had great <laughs> like style and energy. And I was like fangirling from across the room. Sometimes I can be completely awkward. And then one day you came up towards the end and you introduced yourself. And I felt like so special and I was so glad to meet you. And we've stayed in touch loosely over the years. I think it's about five years ago, almost, which is crazy. Um, and I just have really respected what I've seen of your evolution during that time, mm. the journey you've taken with your career evolution, um, as a mom, your crazy, amazing mountain biking and outdoor activities. So I've wanted you on for a while. So again, I thank you so much for, for coming on and, um, so I'd love for you to give folks, um, I'll shut up and turn the mic over to you and would love for you to give folks kind of an eye into your evolution and, you know, what's, what's led you to be so focused, especially on the climate and, and the environment. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, a sincere thank you for all the kind things you just said as, as a woman, I'm working on, um, being better at accepting compliments. And I think. <laughs> just thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you and I originally at Hatch connected, Hatch is such a busy and amazing three days. And yeah. I was so grateful we were able to connect at the very end, but I think it was really around downhill mountain biking, right? Yeah. Like, um, because it's something that's really important to both of us, but I, I'm so grateful it's led to such a, a much larger conversation. Yeah. Um, so, the question was how I like my evolution since Hatch or how I got involved in Hatch. No, you're, I think, well, actually I would love to hear how you got involved in Hatch because I bet it's related to your evolution, your career mm -hmm. evolution, because you've been an entrepreneur, you've worked for other companies, you now are in strategic communications for RMI. Yeah. So would love to just hear how have you navigated and really created your own reality? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be candid in saying that, you know, even as a kid, I largely was creating my own reality. I was definitely that kid who like, instead of playing with other friends would climb a tree and read a book. <laughs> uh, like my brother had a tree fort in the woods and I would just use it to go read. Um, I also, I think it's worth noting that like my climate experience and my climate grief that we'll talk about later really started when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, reading about the Kyoto protocol on the, on the front page of the Boston globe at like my brother's wrestling tournament and honestly like crying. Um, mm -hmm. it was the first time I'd ever heard of this thing called global warming at that time. And I honestly, I just thought it would mean like less snow. Mm -hmm. And that to me, was like incomprehensible that we would let that happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I remember in the, in the days and weeks to follow, just seeing that the adults in charge really weren't going to do anything about it and just being so devastated. Hmm. And so like, that's 1991, right? Like I'm 41 years old now. Um, and so my life and my career has been an evolution of, of very much experiencing that deep sadness about what we would do to this very precious and fragile planet that we have the great fortune to live on. Um, and then just not really wanting to work directly in it because of the fear that it would be overwhelming to me on an emotional level. Right. Um, but I, you know, I went to, I went to the university of Vermont and I got an English degree because I've always loved reading and analyzing information. And then, you know, I was like dating a guy who was going to be a rafting guide outside of Glacier. Um, so we packed up his truck and moved to Whitefish, Montana, thinking it would just be for a summer. And I 
found this farm called Purple Frog Gardens to volunteer and work on. And I thought I was going to be like an organic farmer, um, which it turns out I had, a, I had a very romanticized vision of what that means, right? Like what I really am is a gardener um, who also likes to have time to mountain bike and hike and like swim and, and do other things in the summer, which is not possible for real farmers. Um, but while I was there, the, one of the farmers was working in IT for this guy named Brian Schweitzer, who was running for governor of Montana. And he happened to be running his campaign out of Whitefish because that's where he and his family lived. And he, I met him once and he hired me to do some like basic paperwork and filing for the campaign. And over the course of the next two years, um, I took sort of a leadership role in directing a lot of the campaign messaging, constituent facing correspondence, um, really cut my teeth on writing for politics and, you know, politics, let's be honest, like the, the tactics of politics are largely marketing. Uh -huh. um, so he was elected, he was the first Democrat elected in 16 years in Montana and he went to office and I as a 24 year old was completely burnt out and went to like, you know, I taught skiing in Colorado and I went to New Zealand for a few months, came back, um, and then he saw me working in a coffee shop in Whitefish and once again, like offered the opportunity to go to work in his office in Helena. So I ended up doing that for um, a little over four years, primarily marketing Montana's energy reserves mm -hmm. in Montana. So like Brian was really on the forefront of pushing wind in Montana. And that was fascinating to me. Um, it was my first like feeling of like real sense of purpose in work. Mm -hmm. Um, it was great. I did ultimately go through a huge life transition during that time that caused me to like leave that job and go to Peru for eight months with my mountain bike. That could be a whole other story. Um, <laughs> came back from that and started, you know, transitioned some freelance marketing gigs that I had largely from the connections I'd made in the governor's office mm -hmm. into an agency. Um, and for seven years, I ran a branding and marketing studio called Spur Studio. Um, learned a lot about what it means to own and run a business while also doing the work, the creative work that it takes to keep that going. Learned a lot about how hard it is to do that when an unexpected pregnancy rolls into the mix and then you have to support a child with that work. Um, and so, you know, about three years ago now, a former marketing client reached out to me to take over as the executive director for an, an ocean plastics nonprofit um, that was going to be using this really cool technology to convert ocean plastic to clean power and an inner glass. It was a wonderful concept, maybe a little bit before its time. Um, so ultimately I left that because I saw a listing for the job that I think was written just for me, right? Like, <laughs> the stars aligned, the, the gods convened, and they wrote a job listing for me that I happened to see um, through a friend, right? And it was this job listing for a strategic, strategic communications role at Climate Intelligence, which is, to put it very succinctly, largely the business intelligence division of RMI. RMI is a global climate action solutions group. Um, what my program does is like really make the emissions data more visible, standardized, and to allow us to see like into you know insights into supply chains as to where we could reduce emissions and have the biggest climate wins in this decade. Wow. So that that was a very long story. No, and it's that, so great, Shannon. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, just as you did, because I think we have people of all walks of life various stages of their careers who listen to this, and I think it's so great to share that real leaders, like not everybody's journey looks the same. It's not, you know, what you described is not this very linear. I went to school for this, which qualified me to have this job. And then I went up the corporate ladder this way. And it, I think it's so nice and refreshing to hear someone talk about different choices. They talk in an authentic way. We were talking about this earlier, like your path in life is to find a way forward there's no other option there that's that warrior spirit yeah and it's and I think it really came through when you talking about your evolution that you got yourself a long journey 
Yeah. Um, you know, you and I, before we started recording, we're talking about there's, there's like a beauty in pain, right? Because when you experience pain, you over time find like better and quicker ways of becoming resilient to pain mm -hmm. and quickly finding a way out of that pain and into something that is meaningful, meaningful and fulfilling and healing. Right. And so you know, without going into too many details, I would say that my life has involved a lot of challenge. Um, it has involved a lot of situations that I had to find a way beyond the pain to, to just not get lost there. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, in paddling, there's the term eddying out, right. Where you like, you're in the white water and it's crazy. And then you see a calm spot and you eddy out. And that's my whole life has just been like looking for the place to eddy out for a minute so I can see what's next and then go there. Yeah. But you can't just eddy out and stay there. Right. Mm -hmm. Like nothing you need is really there other than a little bit of rest. And if you stay there, you're going to stagnate and it's just going to be way more challenging to get back in the flow. And so, yeah. you know, I think that that's maybe what you heard in my career story is just like how that has presented in, in my professional life and in my mm -hmm. personal life, it's, it's manifested in very different ways, but equally valuable for me. Yeah. It's so interesting as you're talking about it, there is this element of like embracing that, you know, as you were talking about the eddy out and you get to the calm, you also realize that it's not going to stay calm forever and you're going to get to a different place and then have an, you know, it's going to be challenging as well. And it doesn't mean it always has to bring you down, but these are part, I think, of continuing to stay aware, continue to evolve, continue to get to like sort of jump to the next rock type thing. Yeah. Um, and there is a bit of just accepting that there's going to be challenging moments through it that will help to, we talked about, you know, standing in strength and, and help us to, you know, continue to be strong and um, just continue to, again, like embrace that and evolve. I think it's so important. Yeah, I mean, it's necessary, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's necessary when it is. Right. I think, um, I think there are a lot of people whose lives lend themselves to like an easier transition and easier path from one thing mm. to the next. And, and, um, I, I, I don't think that my, my life or the way that I've experienced life is any more valuable. It's just, it just teaches you a different way of yeah. looking at, you know, like if we're going to go back to the, the analogy of, of eddying out, it's like, it just teaches you a different way of reading the water. Yes. You know, and like, it doesn't mean that if it's easy, it's not good, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that if it's hard, it's not good. It just means it is what it is. Yeah. And you have to move. And that's like, that's, that's the mantra we use every day in working in climate is like, it is what it is. Right. We are where we are. Mm -hmm. We will have to face a certain level of consequences in the future for actions we've already taken, but that does not mean that we just give up because we like the consequences are sad or scary. Um, it means we actually like really right now have to do what we can do to get forward and get through. It means we have to like really, you know, engage like show up like however you want to phrase it um every tenth of a degree to which the planet's climate changes in the future will have significant impacts on our human quality of life ecosystems and you know thermodynamic processes mm -hmm. like feedback loops right? right so every day that we can collectively as a global society choose to work on the solutions and move those forward rather than wringing our hands and arguing about what to do, the better off we will be in, in our lifetimes. Yeah. And, but especially for our children and their children and, you know, however long that we think we can keep this human species in a good place on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. We, you, we mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the, um, dynamic of, climate grief, which the, when you said it to me the first time, I had never heard it before, but it made so much sense, um, you know, because it just going to like some of the reality that we see 
that's happening in this world to the climate, um, you know, is it can feel really paralyzing. It can feel scary. Um, and, you know, it, and you're dealing in the data in real time, which is really heavy on a, on a daily basis. And I think, you know, and you're right in the middle of it, right? So many other people as citizens, we can kind of tune in and tune out, <laughs> um, you know, but, but, you know, I think you, you, you used a term with me of applied hope um, mm -hmm. yeah. that I'd love for you to, to share. And I think, because what I would really like is for the people who are listening to like, under, get a sense of like, what's really going on? What are you seeing? But also then how are you, uh, what is that theory of like applied hope that can get people to like take action mm -hmm. um, and to actually contribute to making things better? <laughs> or not yeah. pulling back, you know? Um, yeah, the first thing I'll say is applied hope um, is, it was remarks that the founder of RMI, Amory Levins made at, I believe a UC Berkeley um, graduation ceremony, maybe five or 10 years ago. And it's available, if you'd look, I think it's on Medium, um, but you can just type in applied hope, Amory Lovins, and you will find it. And I, I cannot recommend enough that people read this piece because for me, it was the first time that somebody had really articulated what I've been feeling mm. around my fear and sadness related to climate and other environmental disasters, as well as the way that I choose to move forward. And my, all of my teammates at RMI choose to move forward on a daily basis and how I think anyone who's feeling that fear and sadness and sense of loss really can choose to deal with it. And so the, the premise of applied hope is that rather than losing yourself to the doom and gloom of the stories that we continually see about extreme weather events, as well as you know the, these exposés on things that have not been done about climate, and what we're still not doing and where we're falling short. And rather than giving into that sense of hopelessness, that there's nothing we can do and, and the game has been lost or going completely to the other side and deciding like, it will be what it, it will be and I'm sure it will be fine. Like, <laughs> we'll just see what happens. Um, Applied hope is the idea that every day you roll up your sleeves and with the information available to you and your skill sets and your resources, you choose to move the ball down the court steadily and strategically, and you just keep at it, right? Like you don't, you just don't give up in that moment when you're like, you know, 14 points down or whatever, like, I'm not a really like a big sports person, person. So I'm going to mess up these analogies, but like, you just keep moving, you yeah. just keep going and you, you choose to do that because there's great reason to, mm -hmm. we as a species have all of the technological solutions we could possibly need to make the changes we need in the next decade to have a, you know, not to be dramatic, but like to have a livable climate future, right? Mm -hmm. We have it. We just need the will to implement it, do it, live it. It is going to mean changes in our lives and our economy, likely. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of it means like better yeah. economy, like better things, better life. But it's going to take a lot in that moment of like the inflection point when you have to sort of do things differently and economic systems have to be reconfigured or like markets have to be reconfigured. But for me, there's no question like that discomfort that we will go through as a global society while we figure it out mm -hmm. is much less than the global discomfort we will go through if we have a climate future that leads to just relentless conflict over resource, right? Mm -hmm. And like that's, there's no delicate way of saying if we continue to do nothing, the forces of nature are absolutely the white walkers at our gates, right? Mm -hmm. Like they are storming the castle. It is up to us to decide to do something and to mm -hmm. fight and, and not just let it happen. Yeah. And I think you were talking about this 
about the decisive decade. And I think it's a lot of what you were just talking about. Like there's no time left for inaction. And, and I think, you know, I, I would imagine, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but there's, there's like no effort too small. <laughs> and it's everything from don't run the water tap while you're brushing your teeth to, you know, uh, there's so many things, but, um, you know, I think that's a huge message that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you as, as we end, like takeaways that you, you know, if you had one or two takeaways, but, you know, for me, I like, I kind of obsess about the climate. <laughs> um, I think part of that is living where I do in Colorado, as we were talking about, you know, if we don't get rain, I'm literally worried that our reservoirs aren't going to have water and, you know, we're not going to have water to drink in the summer. And I think that, you know, again, um, just imploring people to really embrace, there's no action too small and there's no, there's, there's no waiting. So you know, I think, I think, you know, so I actually, before we get to um, just your thoughts on like takeaways, I would love for, talked a lot about things that you're seeing in your work, how RMI is working, um, mm -hmm. but for citizens, for business people, for brand, you know, people who are actually representing a brand, people who are hearing this, like, is there a way, what are ways that people can support what you're doing with RMI? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll back up by saying that RMI is now a 40 year old organization and there's 400 plus of us working around the world um, and there's 12 distinct programs. So the answer to what we're doing is, is not, it's not any one thing. It's kind of every, like, like you talked about, it's like everything from all angles, um, all with the mission of aligning the planet with a 1.5 degrees Celsius climate change climate future, right? So like scientists have essentially told us that is the limit to which we can go, that we will not suffer the most dire consequences of climate mm. change. So everything we do every day is moving the ball down the court towards that goal. Okay. Um, I personally, I work in the climate intelligence division and what we really look at is how data transparency, like better data, more accessible data, more visible data can really help decarbonize the heaviest emitting industrial chain. So like steel, aluminum, cement, mm -hmm. plastics, <clears throat> oil and gas. Um, and so, you know, we, Our goal is to help industry stakeholders make better decisions, not by force, but by showing them that there can be very real emissions and cost savings in doing things differently, right? So I'm not one of the technicians on our team, and you would probably want one of those people to come on and tell you the distinct steps they can take and, and what it really means to use blockchain technology to trace emissions from raw extraction all the way to the product level. Um, but I can tell you, we are engaging these industry stakeholders in a way that, you know, we want, we want them to win, right? We want them to win in terms of helping advance towards these announced climate goals that most brands have made at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to win in terms of being the preferred supply chain partners. So the ways that any brand or company or individual can really engage with RMI and support us are like one, you know, we are an NGO, you know, charitable contributions are always welcome. We do have a great pipeline, but it, you know, there's a ton of work to do. Um, and secondly, I would say, look within the distinct program areas at RMI and see where you, which of those programs can really help you fit meet your individual climate goals, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are a contractor, it might be the buildings program that can help you retrofit buildings and build better in the future, or maybe to like figure out what you can do within the existing market to, to kind of decarbonize your operations. Mm -hmm. If you are, you know, if you are a Walmart or an Amazon and you want to figure out how you can hit your climate action goals within your supply chain decisions, probably call me or Paolo or Mark or Charles and my team 
Um, if you are in the oil and gas industry and want a clear market-driven strategy to decarbonize without breaking the economy, definitely call the oil and gas team at Climate Intelligence headed by Debbie Gordon. Like I, the people I worked with are absolutely my friends and more so my heroes. These people are brilliant. They have largely worked in the industries that we are working to decarbonize. And so they understand the game from a very real on the ground perspective. Um, and more importantly, we all make each other laugh all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would say that is the one thing that, you know, as, as you talked about having my eyes on the climate data dashboard, yeah, that that is heavy. Humor is a great way of making it lighter. Um, taking an afternoon to go ski at the, you know, the bridge was like 15 miles from my house and taking an afternoon to go ski there makes it lighter. Mm. Um, mountain bike rides that take everything I have to get up the hill and recharge <laughs> me on the downhill. Like, you know, that feeling, right? Yeah. It's like, these are the things that we can do to enjoy our lives and the natural places that we love without getting so bogged down. Mm. Um, but you have to choose it, right? You have to choose to just enjoy what's happening around you in the moment. And I will tell you that wildfires, like wildfire season in the West has now become a really, really challenging experience mm -hmm. for me, for a lot of us, because you can't let it go. No. Right. Like you can't just jump on your bike and go do the thing and let it go because you honestly like can't breathe when you go no. do the thing. Yeah. And that's one of those things where it, um, that is so hard for me to deal with. And again, you just find a way, right? Like I have a lot of plants inside my house now for those times when I can't really do too much outside. I, you know, put in six raised garden beds in my front yard and planted a couple trees because for the, all the times when I couldn't get up to the mountain and see like the, you know, vast sweeping views of nature, I could at least like go look at the bees buzzing around on the dahlias. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, I hope that answered the question about applied hope and, and how I attempt to bring it into my own life yeah. in my usual rambling style. No, no, it was, it's absolutely fantastic. And I think it's such a great way of making it relatable. I think that, you know, something that is as monstrous as the, you know, the impact on our climate that we're seeing, I think can be something that does invoke fear and that people a lot of times can either try to ignore or, or it's just not part of their reality. And so I think it's really helpful when you can share authentic, relatable, elements of it. Um, and I really love the way that you talked about RMI. There's so many areas that I think as people are listening, if, if any of those areas apply to you or to other people, like mm -hmm. we as a, like humanity is in this together, um, I think. And so I just really appreciate you sharing all of that. Um, there's a lot of different avenues and there's a lot of action to be taken, um, that can be taken. Um, and, and, not taking action just isn't an option in, in my humble opinion. <laughs> right, and one of the things we are very aware of and, and mindful of is climate action does not look the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, some ways that you and I can take climate action is largely a result of privilege mm -hmm. and does not apply to a lot of the world's citizens. So yeah. you know, we have a Global South program that really looks at like, how do we make sure that as a global society, we don't come up with rules and regulations that protect us, but leave like half of the world's population in, in living conditions that are like, you know, it's like not fair that we right. would get all the way to where we are with the wealth that we have accumulated in so many ways. And then like kind of pull the ladder up behind us in terms of saying like, now you can't do that. Um, so you have to find a way that's like just and equitable for human populations in addition to, um, you know, helping to pre preserve the climate that keeps our natural ecosystems intact. Uh, and that's another focus area in climate intelligence is the ESG component of, 
of climate is how do you make sure in your um, critically important, urgent race to save the climate that you don't just leave people behind? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Thank you for for touching on that. So before I let you go, I just want to ask one last thing, and that is of all the things that we've talked about today, whether it was before or during this recording part, um, are there any key takeaways that you want to leave people with? It's I, I struggle with this part because I don't want to sound luxury or you know rah rah rah, um, but what I want to leave people with is like there is so much still that can be done. Mm -hmm. There is so much we can do to make our world better for ourselves and our children, and just rather than losing more time to to feeling you know the deep fear and sadness about it and not doing anything, choose to put pressure on your policymakers and the brands that you buy from mm -hmm. and support organizations that are in the trenches doing the work and just find ways to engage. And please don't waste any more of your time trying to be less of yourself to fit into what society expects of you. So, you know, I feel like as women, we've collectively spent so much of our, you know, brain power trying to figure out ways to be smaller and more societally beautiful and and palatable right and that brain like we need it now we need it to save the planet in a way that we want to live on it um there is so much good work to be done please do, like don't spend any time beating yourself up for ways you think you're less than or not worthy because I guarantee you, you are, you just need to shift your focus into the areas that actually feed you and nourish you in an emotional and, and physical way. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the way you shared that. I couldn't agree more as we talked about earlier, shared experiences and learning to stand in your strength is, is really key. So Everybody, uh, we talked a lot today about some pretty important things. So I hope that this leaves you with things to consider um, and various ways that you can potentially take some action. So thank you so much, Shannon. We'll let you go and good luck in your day. Thanks so much, Shannon. It was great talking to you. Um, hope yeah. to catch up in person soon. <laughs>